خصوصاً على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified Glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam We are now in the last day of this, the second International Islamic Retreat which is taking place here in Cape Town in Simon's Town. We thank Allah who has made it possible for the retreat to take place. And we pray and pray and pray even more that Allah may bless the young and the small team who have worked so very hard here in Cape Town so very hard to make this retreat possible and to provide us with all the beauty of yesterday with that lovely drive around the sea coast and the nice uh, barbecue dinner last night and the biryani that's coming up today <laughs> and we pray that Allah may make it possible for a third international Islamic retreat to take place about one year from now uh, in Malaysia or in Brunei and that Allah may bless His Excellency uh, Ambassador Yuvadlan Rose uh, on whose back he doesn't know it is yet <laughs> There's going to be a lot of responsibility for organizing that retreat in Malaysia, inshallah. Amen. Our subject today is uh, the Muslim village, and in fact, it is the culmination of all that we were taught <coughs> during the retreat. What we have done in this retreat is to turn to the Quran and turn to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they might explain the strange world in which we live today. <coughs> and that as a result of that explanation, we can anticipate what tomorrow has in store. And that they might guide us how to respond to the awesome challenges of the modern age. It is to Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah that we owe the deepest depth of gratitude that he should put this in the curriculum of studies of Delhi May Institute of Islamic Studies using the word modern thought to ask us to study the modern age and we've done that we have come to a conclusion concerning the modern world Our conclusion is based on objective analysis of objective data all around us. You can see it. <coughs> we say that this is a world that is collapsing. We say that we are looking at this world with two eyes, not with one. And we say that this looks like the worst world there's ever been. There's never been more godlessness. There's never been more decadence. Yes, there has been godlessness in different parts of the world. Yes, there has been decadence in different parts of the world. Yes, there has been oppression in different parts of the world in history. But we are saying that today it is universalized and it has been globalized and so godlessness is now globalized decadence is now globalized oppression is now globalized and what we are seeing those who see with two eyes is that we are seeing for the first time in human history a political dictatorship descending upon the entire world 
and it looks very ugly. Libya is getting a taste of it now. An economic dictatorship descending upon all of mankind. A financial dictatorship descending upon all of mankind that I have de defined as a financial Guantanamo waiting to occur. We say this is the worst of all possible worlds. <coughs> A world in which those who have faith in Allah and whose conduct is righteous are now targeted, demonized, terrorized. A world in which there is universal poverty and destitution and a few people A few people are traveling with permanent first-class tickets on this ship. <coughs> and our conclusion is that this is not going to last. That this ship is sinking. But then there are others who see with only one eye and who are dazzled by the cell phones and the internet and the wireless laptop and by something called Skype. Is that how you pronounce it? And MSN Messenger, is that how you call it? And chatting on a chat room with people from all over the world and so on. Now this is the best of all worlds where you can fly back and forth in minutes where yesterday it used to take months. There's never been a better world than this. Not only is this the best of all worlds, but more than that. All that came before this world have now been superseded, have now become redundant and religion is included in that. It has been superseded. Religion now belongs to the museums of history. Huh? This is the difference between those who see with two eyes and those who see with one. Our subject here is directed only to those who see with two eyes. Our subject is applicable and relevant only to those who recognize that we are on board a sinking ship. If you are not convinced that this is a sinking ship, then you can stay in Johannesburg, no problem. We say that this ship is sinking and as a consequence we need to get off the ship. We recognize that the ship is sinking most of all because of shirk. Yes, there is riba, which is very bad. Yes, there is zina, which is terrible, it stinks. And there are so many other things that are causing the ship to sink. But we say that the ship is sinking most of all because of shirk that we are now enveloped and embraced by a universal ship and that is why the ship is sinking. <coughs> there is evidence in the hadith. Of course, you know that Allah says in the Quran, this is the one sin that he will not forgive. He says that in the Quran. We have, we have reminded you several times in this retreat of the hadith which is located in Sahih Bukhari four times in Sahih Bukhari four times from so four different sources four different chains of narration that on judgment day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Adam alayhi salam take out the people for the hellfire 
and he will ask how many are there O Allah and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply and say out of every 1000 take 999 for the hellfire if that is not a wake up call well then what else can a wake up call be The companions of the Prophet ﷺ were dismayed, terrified when they heard that. And he could see it in their faces. And then he smiled and he said, good news for you. Good news for you. The one for Jannah will be from you. From you. Meaning, a people who have the truth and who live the truth not George Bush and company. The 999, however, he described as Gog and Magog and as Ahlu Gog, Ahlu Yajuj wa Ma'juj. In other words, in other words, a God who is merciful and forgiving and who is prepared to forgive all sins. Inna Allah yaghfiru zunuba jamia. Allah is prepared to forgive all sins. Tell my servants, even if they come to me with sins as high as the sky, I will forgive them all. A God who is merciful and forgiving and compassionate, sends 999 out of every 1,000 into the hellfire. What explanation can there be for it? There's only one. Shirk. Because he said, I will not forgive this sin. He said, the one for Jannah will be from me. Will be from, from you, sorry. And the 999 would be from Gog and Magog. From this hadith, we have two major signs of the last day. We have shirk, universal shirk, which will come only from Dajjal. He said about that shirk, he said that the shirk of this ummah, the hadith is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the shirk of this ummah would be as difficult to recognize as it would be to recognize a black ant on a black stone in the darkness of the night. And the kafara, he said, you should recite, O oh Allah, kindly protect me from the shirk of which I am not aware. The shirk which I commit of which I am not aware. And kindly forgive me for the sins that I knowingly commit. The child is the mastermind of the universal shirk. And in this hadith there is also Gog and Magog. That when Gog and Magog are released, we know that they will spread out in all directions. And Gog and Magog have as their trademark facade. They corrupt and destroy everything. And as they embrace 999 out of every 1000, a global society emerges. And that global society would be the global society or the Jamaat of God and Magad. We are saying to you in this retreat, having dealt with the subject of God and Magad in one extended session of this retreat, we are saying to you that the global society around the world today that we fondly describe as the Blue Jeans Jamaat is the Jamaat of God and Magad and it's taking all of mankind into the hellfire. And it has as its basic characteristic, its shirk. Having said that, from sinking. No. 
because only Allah can destroy Gaga and Magar. If you are not convinced that Gog and Magog have been released and that we are now living in a world in which Gog and Magog control power and Gog and Magog explains the universal facade. If you have not been convinced, then we cannot proceed with the Muslim village. You can continue to live in Johannesburg. If on the other hand you are you recognize the universal facade in the world today. And you recognize that this is the work of Gog and Magog. Then you would know that you cannot prevent the ship from sinking. If you are on board a sinking ship, and when the ship sinks, it's going to take all those who are on board. Even those who build a 50 million rand wood masjid, oh, you can see it like a palace. <coughs> and the masjid is full with people. <laughs> but when the ship sinks, it's going down with all of them. What do you do? Our answer in this retreat is simple. You got to get off the ship. Do we have any parallel in the Quran? Yes, we do. In which surah? Surah to Yes. And we have in this retreat explained that subject that the young men lived in a world which was saturated with shit. They could not prevent the shit. They stood up and they denounced the shit. They stood up and they declared their faith in Allah. Fearlessly. But the the town, the city in which they live, demonize them, terrorize them, as the world does today with us, who dare to proclaim our faith in Islam and to stand up and tell them you are a godless <coughs> world, you are an oppressor. Not all Muslims are like that, unfortunately. There are some who prefer to put the job first and Allah after. Put the green card first and put Allah after. Put the U.S. visa first and put Allah after. Put the house in which they live in Rondabosh first and put Allah after. <laughs> and such people, such people will not do what the young men in Surah al did, who stood up and declared their faith fearlessly. Only those who do that, only those who stand up for al-ma'ruf and stand up against al-munkar. And this is our mission. Kuntum khayla ummatin ukhrijat linnas ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil-ma'ruf وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ This is the mission that Allah gave to us. To stand up for what is truth and for what is justice. And to stand up against what is false and what is unjust and oppressive. Only those Muslims who fulfill this mission, only they are targeted. The rest can go home and have braai for dinner and go to sleep. You know it's braai now. That's what you had for dinner last night. <coughs> no, they don't call it barbecue in Cape Town. They call it braai. I can't pronounce it, but something like that, braai. Hmm? So, <laughs> these young men gave us the model of conduct. The model of conduct. 
If you stand up like this in the United States today, you lose your job. No question about it. You lose your job. And then your wife is going to take a pot and beat you on your head. Your children are going to curse you. Because we're going to have to leave the United States now, and this is heaven. We're going to have to leave heaven to go back to hell in Pakistan. Daddy, why did you do this? <laughs> huh? These young men stood up and gave us the model of conduct, becoming of the believer in the age of Ita. And eventually they had to flee. They had to make a hijra. Have you ever heard about the word hijra? You have? Hijra? Is it sunnah? It is? Is it sunnah of Muhammad Is it also the sunnah of Ibrahim Look at that. This is hijra. Rather than stay back and strike a deal, rather than stay back and compromise <coughs> to keep your job and keep your wife happy. Oh, sometimes it's the wife who wants to go. They've been writing to me, women have been writing to me. The husband doesn't want to leave. He wants to stay in heaven. <laughs> the other way around. If you stand up like this, then you have to leave. And these young men left. This is getting off the ship. And they fled to the cave. And when they fled to the cave, how did Allah <coughs> respond? I'm not talking about your boss and your company. I'm talking about Allah, the one who created you from a drop of sperm. Allah was pleased with their conduct. Flee to the cave. What comes after? Yang Shurlakum Rabbukum Mirahmati. Allah will shower you with His mercy. What more do you want from that than that to get off the ship? So now welcome to the subject of getting off the ship, or rather getting off the sinking ship. What do we do if we are to get off the sinking ship? Our first obligation is to try to establish the Deen wherever we can. So you're not jumping off the ship to go off on your own. Tom going so, Harry going so, Dick going so, Mahmoud going so, Ali going so. No. <laughs> your first obligation when you're getting off the ship is to recognize that you cannot restore macro-Islam at this time. You cannot restore the Khilafah. You cannot restore Darul Islam because the forces of God and Magog are too powerful for you. If you are not convinced that God and Magog have been released, then you would not recognize that this is the God and Magog world order. Okay? In which case, we'll ask you, well, how come you're not going to search for the barrier? Built a barrier, built a, built a blocks of iron, please go and search for it for us. And ask Google Earth to help you. <laughs> we cannot restore Darul Islam today. If you want to, you could try. Even, uh, uh, what's his name in Mullah Omar? in the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. When they controlled Afghanistan and declared the Emirate of Afghanistan, <coughs> even they were begging to be admitted to the United Nations organization, to be recognized as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. 
and therefore once they are recognized as a legitimate government of Afghanistan, which they were begging and begging the UN to accept, they would now have been, they would have acceded to the Charter of the United Nations. And the Charter of the United Nations gives authority to the Security Council over the Khalifa. When the Security Council says to the Khalifa, sit down, he has to sit down. Didn't Mullah Omar think about that? And when the Security Council says to the Khalifa, stand up, he has to stand up. Because the Security Council must be obeyed. So no way in the world do we have Darul Islam today. And it is not possible to restore Darul Islam because you need to control, you have sovereignty over territory. And they will not allow you to have that. They want to rule the world. Our conclusion is that if we cannot restore macro-Islam, we still have a duty to establish the deen, waqim deen And therefore we option, our option is the micro-model. To establish Islam at the micro-level. Where can we do that? It cannot be done in the cities. Because the cities are the centers of the war on Islam. And so our conclusion is, not a cave, no, they chose a cave. Not a cave, why? Because our first option is to <coughs> establish the deen. When we try and we fail to establish the deen, then the cave. So we say, let us go to the countryside, where the storm is not blowing so fiercely. Let us go to the remote countryside. And in the remote countryside, let us establish micro models. So small communities. And this is what we call a village. The Malay have a nice word for it. What is it? No Malay must answer me. No Singaporean must answer me. What do you call it? Kampung. Kampung. Were you from Put? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. And, uh, there is another reason why we should choose Kampung. Kampung meaning the village. There's another reason why we should choose Kampung. Because Dajjal spoke to Tamim Dari, the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. And, and uh, Dajjal asked Tamim Dari a number of questions. And at the end of it, Dajjal declared, I I'm Dajjal. And when I am released, I'll have, I will enter every town and every city, but he didn't mention Kampu. And the evidence is fair. That when you go to the remote countryside today, you will see a way of life which is as yet not corrupted by the city. When, of course, you see the mini skirts coming into a village, you know that, that that village is being embraced by the city. So, the Muslim village has a rationale behind it. It has a metaphysics based on the release of Gog and Magog and of Dajjal. When we move to the Muslim village, it is for the purpose of seeking to establish the deen at the micro level. How do we do that? If we can move to an existing village, it's easier than creating a new village brand new that takes time and resources. It is a new village or an existing village one of the first things that we have to achieve is the Jama'a and the Amir. That's the basic structure of the Muslim village, the Jama'a and the Amir. If there are non-Muslims in the village, 
then the jama'a will have links with them as a collective unit. It is not that individual Muslims will be negotiating with individual Hindus and individual Jews, no. So the village will have as a unit the Muslim community and as a unit the Hindu community and as a unit the Jewish community, for example. And these communities will have a collective agreement for sharing the same space. We call that a <coughs> plural model. Plural model of a state, plural model of a community. And this is exactly what the Prophet did Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam when he reached the Medina. <coughs> but we're not going to spend time today on how to negotiate that agreement or constitution for the village. No. We're going to spend more time on the Muslim community in the village. It has to be one jama'ah and one amir. And since it's a small village, one, one masjid, you don't need two. All the Muslims in the village who want to be counted as a part of the village must give the bay'ah or the oath of allegiance to the Amir. The Amir is chosen based upon knowledge, knowledge of the Quran coming first. Because if you don't know the Quran, you're not going to survive, not at all. And we have in this retreat spoken to some extent on methodology of studying the Quran. But having chosen your Amir, whether he be black or white, or brown or yellow, even if he has a head with dry grapes, said the Prophet obey him, obey him. But that's a problem today, because this is the age of boxing gloves. Yeah. You have this group out here who say they alone have the true Islam. And those fellas out there committing shirk morning, noon and night. And you have this group out here who demonize that group out there. And so you have sectarian warfare. It is spreading like a disease all over the world. His father, Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, and I jointly, we were jointly invited to conduct an Islamic lecture tour of Malaysia about 10 years ago probably. And it was a very nice lecture tour, Bilal Phillips and myself, around, they say he's a Sufi and he's a Salafi. <laughs> we, were, we were friends with each other. So Malaysia was amazed. How could Bilal Phillips and Imran Hussein get along so well? Hmm? When the lecture tour was over, go and look at the internet and see, and read what they're saying. Hmm? The boxing gloves were out. <coughs> the boxing gloves were out. How do we deal with the problem of sectarianism? Our answer is, and if you have a better answer, please give it to us. Our answer is, only the Quran and only Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, can unite the Muslims. That's our answer. And so it is the Quran and the Sunnah which must unite the community. Good. And so we say in the masjid, we will not permit in the masjid anything which is not firmly based on the Quran and the universally recognized sunnah. All right? Okay. But there are practices, religious practices, which have emerged over time. Very large numbers of Muslims all over the world today, including my own teacher, 
and his teacher before him stood up and sang in praise of the Prophet and if your answer is well we must part from those people we can't have anything to do with it how are you going to unite them in the village hmm? this is our answer if you have a better answer please give it to us and we will take it our answer is if a religious practice is not overtly evil, like we're going to have a zikr with whiskey. <laughs> and when the zikr is over, we're going to really dance. <laughs> that, is, that is evil. Okay? But if we're going to have a zikr as conducted by where is the imam? Imam? Oh. Where is your sign? There is the there is. What's his name again? Sheikh Mani. Sheikh Mani. MashaAllah. May Allah bless Sheikh Mani. May Allah bless Sheikh Mani. May Allah bless Sheikh Mani. If you have a religious practice which is clearly beneficial but which is not based on the Qur'an and the universally recognized sunnah, like the one I have. That I have a zikr of the recitation of Surah Al-Kaf. Recitation of Surah Al-Kaf on the day of Jummah, that is firmly in the sunnah. But collective recitation of Surah Al-Kaf is not. It's not. Because it is not the collective recitation is not in the sunnah. But I have chosen to have the collective recitation because there are some people who don't ever recite the Quran. Never. There are others who don't know how to recite the Quran. They are always think of the English Quran. <laughs> huh? And there are others who are so weak that if I have the collective, they will come and they will recite. But when I don't have it, they will not do it. So you have to teach them to creep, creep. So for this reason I have the collective recitation of Surah al on the day of Jumah. But because it is not in the Sunnah, I do not take it to the Masjid. No. I do not take it into the public life. No. I bring it into the private in order to avoid fitna in order to avoid fitna. So this is the methodology for solving <laughs> the sectarian cancer. <coughs> that in the Muslim village, the masjid and the public life of the village would be firmly built on the foundations of the Quran and the universally recognized sunnah. Any other religious practice, regardless of how beneficial it is, regardless of how many people are engaged in it, we will say keep it in the private and do not bring it into the public so that we do not avoid, we can avoid fitna. And so in this village, Bilal Phillips and Imran Hussein can live comfortably together. Oh yes. But when someone comes into the village now and sees or hears about someone in private standing up and singing in praise of the Prophet and starts shouting bid'ah haram. What do we do? After of course warning that person. We'll ship them out of the village faster than Federal Express. <laughs> Why? Because you're creating fitna. Now then, this is my plan for the village. To solve the problem of disunity. To bring unity. To resolve the problem of sectarianism. If you have a better plan, please give it to us. This is an age of not only 
facade in the social sphere, which is the sectarianism, there's also facade in other spheres as well. Facade in food. Food. Supermarket food is increasingly going in the direction of something called, I don't know if you've ever heard about it, rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to feed your children rubbish? Huh? The genetically modified food and the link with food functioning medicinally. The genetically modified food and the immune system. The genetically modified food and the capacity of the male to produce sperm in which you'll have male chromosomes and female chromosomes. Is there a link between food and sperm production? Is there a link between food and the capacity of the body to produce the male chromosomes? Because when you don't have the male or the male is too weak, then the female is born. Hmm? Food production, milk production, and today the hormones in the milk. And if you keep on drinking the hormones in the milk, would women have beards tomorrow? And would men now develop in such a way that looking at a profile you don't know who's a man and who's a woman? Hmm? Hormones in the milk. Thank Allah that we have amongst our sisters some who are doing good research on the subject and we're going to ask them to talk later on. So in the village, to make it short now, in the village we have an absolute obligation to produce our own food, to produce our own milk, to produce our own meat. So dairy farming, <coughs> food crops, and to try as best as we can to avoid genetically modified seeds. And sometime earlier in this retreat we showed how we can do it without having to spend money going to laboratories to check out the seed. The way we do it is with honey, honey production, because the bees will not go to those plants which have come from genetically modified seeds. In this way, our children will grow up in the Muslim village, healthy, eating the food that Allah has ordained that they should eat. The youngest member of this retreat, have you met him? Who is he? Mahad. Not Mahad. My grandson Mahad here is about what, 11? 12. 12. No, we have someone, someone younger than him. Ah, Suleiman, yes. Where is Suleiman? Suleiman is how old? One? Just four months. Four months. So Suleiman, Suleiman will grow up eating pure food. If you, the parents, give him rubbish to eat, you will be accountable to Allah on judgment day. All right? And that's what the world is returning to now with the corruption of food. The, the village, because it will be producing organic farming, the best milk, the best meat, and the best food crops in the village, can build an economic base for the village by marketing excess production outside of the village. And remember the five-star restaurants would be happy to buy our, stuff, our food because they want the best and they know they can trust us better than they can trust the other fellows out there. That the Muslims would not be, un, would not be untruthful about the food which is produced. So in the process of attempting to make the village self-sufficient in food production, we'll also build an economic base, agricultural base, which will allow us to have an income for marketing excess production of food. Security 
in the village is a very important subject. Are we not going to be rich to put up walls and have sentries and security guards and dogs and cell phones and machine guns? And no, no, villages are not like that. Villages are simple things. So, we have to make sure that we are small and we have to make sure we don't have any high profile. So I don't think you're going to have BMWs out there in the village. <laughs> no. You do not want to attract attention. So you have to live low profile. So people would not be attracted and think this is a village with wealth, so we can go and do some armed robbery and so on. But also, there are others who may want to attack us and they're not just robbers. They're coming for other reasons. So, the method in which we we'll ensure security is that no stranger, stranger means someone who is not resident in the village, no stranger can enter the village <coughs> unless invited to enter, to enter by a resident. In, Islamic, in the Islamic law of international relations, this is called an, an, an aman. You cannot enter Darul Islam without an aman. Hmm? Today you use the word visa. <laughs> so a villager has to invite you to enter the village in order for you to be admitted into the village. So anytime we find someone in the village who is not a resident, we can stop him. And when he is stopped by any villager, we can demand, who invited you here? And if he does not have an invitation, we ship him out. Okay? So you cannot have your village in public property. You'll have to build your village in private property. You can't have public roads because he has the right to come in on a public road. Hmm? That's one of the methods of ensuring security. But that's daytime when you <coughs> use your eyes and see the people around you. What about the night time? The night time, you're not going to be sleeping on your bed every night. No. Some nights you're going to be out patrolling. It doesn't matter who you are you're going to have to spend some nights patrolling so that you have nighttime security and you have daytime security. The rest of the subject of security should not be discussed in public. That's a matter for the Amir and for the Shura, for them in private to discuss other matters pertaining to security. Are we ready now for the big one? What do we do with women? Should we allow them in our masjid? Pakistan says no. And Pakistan is there. Yeah, where is Pakistan? <laughs> Pakistan says no. India says no. Where is India? India says no. <coughs> What do we do with the woman? Should we allow them in the masjid? Or no? Well, go ahead. If you make mistakes, tomorrow, in fact, some may say not tomorrow, maybe by tonight, they're going to build their own masjids. And a woman is going to be the imam. She's going to lead the salah. She's going to give the khutbah. Others will say, Sheikh Imran, not tonight, it's already happening. It's already happening. And when it comes to you, and you're wringing your hands now in dismay, 
What went wrong at that time? Don't come to me, please. No, because we're telling you now. Women have rights that Allah gave to them. And every time you take away one of their rights, there's a fellow named Dajjal who smiles and rubs his hands in glee. Every time you take away a right that Allah and his messenger gave to a woman. And Allah and his messenger gave women the right to come to the masjid. Yes. And when they came to the masjid, where did they pray? Was it upstairs in the balcony? Or was it downstairs in the basement? Or was it in the annex? Where did they pray? The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, and most women don't know this. And even less, even less men know it. This hadith has been put into something called cold storage. He said, when women perform sujda, they must remain in sujda longer than the men. Why? Because some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves, that's why. Hmm? Where in the world today women do that, stay in the sister longer than the men? Have you seen that? Huh? Well, in order for a woman to have to stay in sister longer than the men, she has to be in the masjid, right? Good, so that problem is solved over the village. <laughs> Number two, she has to be behind the men, isn't it? Because if she's in front of the men, there's no problem. But if they don't have enough cloth, so that she has to be behind the men, okay? That's where Allah's messenger put them. That's where Allah ordered them to be, behind the men. Not because the men are in superior than the women. Because if you put the woman in front of the men, no man will be able to concentrate. <laughs> I have a student in Trinidad. Her name is Farah. I hope she listens when this will be prayed. And she worked very hard in the last retreat. What are we going to do when a woman comes to the village and she says, I want a husband, I want to be married, will that happen? Can that happen? Have you heard the hadith? One of the signs of the last day is that one man will have to maintain how many? Fifty women? Fifty women? I wonder what would cause that tremendous imbalance between men and women. Hmm? Could it be that the cause for the precipitous decline, alarming decline in the birth of baby boys, would be because of something that would be damaging sperm production, <laughs> male chromosome. Hmm? We have a sister here who has some very interesting uh, thoughts on that subject, and you'll hear from her just now. But it is going to happen, and it has already started. An alarming decline of birth of baby boys so that a large number of women for a small number of men. That is something that will make Dajjal rub his hands in glee with smiling. Because that kind of pillow is going to create 
anarchy, sexual anarchy, promiscuity, zina, people stealing each other's husbands, a number of women sharing a single man, and he would be like a slave because they will assign to him. You go there tonight, you go there tonight, you go there tonight, you go there tonight. Yeah, they will assign to him what, he, what are his duties. Yeah. How do we solve that problem that is going to come tomorrow? It is not only a problem for women, it is also a problem, a major problem for men. And it is coming about because we are the authors of our own destruction. The laptop, and notice where the laptop is placed, and the Im impact of the radiation of the laptop on sperm production. The cellular phones, we had in the last retreat a medical doctor from Canada who addressed the retreat on this subject and who provided medical evidence that the use of cellular phones, you can only use a cellular phone when you have these antennas all over, because so the whole area is polluted with radiation, and if you are in that catchment area of this radiation, it affects your male sperm production, hmm? which incidentally means that we should try to locate the Muslim village in a place where cell phones don't work. <laughs> Mind you for some people, eh? <laughs> who are addicted to the cell phones. You could dispense with your wife, but not with your cell phone. <laughs> so we have a situation coming tomorrow. Those who consider this to be the best of all worlds would not be bothering about that. But we are reading this world as a world in which the signs of Allah are ominously unfolding. And we have to use the Qur'an and use Nabi Muhammad to understand and to respond. So what are we going to do when they have chaos out there in the cities? It's a sexual jungle out there in the cities. When the women outnumber the men by such an alarming proportion. What? do we do? The answer is that every woman who comes to the village and who says, I want to be married, somebody has to marry her. So if your wife says, my husband can't take another wife, and she did not put that into the marriage contract at the time of marriage, she can do it. At the time of the marriage contract, she can do it. And if he agrees to it, then he has to abide by that. But if that was not then the marriage contract, then that wife better go back to Johannesburg. The implication is that the men of the village would have to marry every woman who comes to the village and who says, I want to be married. It is not uncharitable on my part to say that not all women are beautiful. Don't tell that to your wife that she's not beautiful. When she cooks, you must ensure that you say this is the best food. <laughs> In my case, I don't have to be untruthful because she does cook the best food. <laughs> you better say that. <laughs> Not all women are beautiful, okay? There are some who are stunning in their beauty. But Allah says in the Quran that He created us from the earth like trees and plants. Where did He say that? Sheikh Ali Mustafa, you don't answer. He says in the Quran that He created us from the earth like trees and plants. Where did He say that? I said, Sheikh Ali Mustafa, do not answer. <laughs> huh? Give me the ayah. Masha Allah. Masha Allah from Egypt. Surah Al-Nuh. 
Wallahu ambatakum. It doesn't say ambatalakum. It says Wallahu ambatakum. And Allah has caused you to grow forth. Wallahu ambatakum min al ardi. Allah has caused you to grow forth from the earth. Nabata. <coughs> like trees and plants. And so in the same way that there are some trees which are ornamental trees, so too there are some women who are stunning in their beauty. And in the same way that there are some trees which are for timber, and some trees which are medicinal trees, and some trees for lovely shade, and some trees for fruit, and some trees for food, and you can go on. So two human beings are different. They're not all the same. So not because she's not the most beautiful woman in the world would you say you're not going to marry her? No. I am marrying you because I want a house in heaven. That's why I'm marrying you. You may have a wife and you may be very happy with your wife, very happy with your family, and to take a second or a third wife is going to make your life more difficult for you. But I'm going to do it for Allah's sake. For Allah's sake. And so in the Muslim village, we must try as best as we can to ensure that there is no woman in the village who wants to be married and is not married. MashaAllah. If we can do that in the village, we'll teach a lesson to the city. But warning. A warning. In this village, we are a family. So if a man abuses his wife, the village is going to come after him. Oh yes. If she comes to the Amir with tears in her eyes, about a husband who is abusing her, the whole village is going to come after him. <coughs> if he does not maintain his family, the village will cry shame on him. Hmm? If he is treating his wives unequally, give this one the diamonds, and this give this one he gives what? Is what is synthetic? <coughs> Costume. Shake Ali Mustafa gives diamonds. Yeah. So, so if you don't treat your wives justly, it is the business of the village. You can't say, stay out of my business. This is my private life. No. Once your wife complains, it becomes the duty of the village to respond. And so we are going to attempt to solve the problem through the institution of plural marriages, which is there in Islam, a mechanism inbuilt to allow us to resolve this problem that they cannot solve. But what about a baby girls? When should they be married? Who should answer that question? The New York Times or CNN? <laughs> Let us turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have any disagreement with him, wait until judgment then you speak to him. Mary, Maria, the mother of Jesus, is assigned to the temple because the mother had made a vow. And she lives in the temple under the guardianship of Zakaria alayhi salam. And the priests in the temple, the rabbis in the temple, oh, they had a good time. You don't have a girl in the temple, it's <laughs> usually boys. So there must have been a lot of fun in the temple with that little girl in the temple. But when she reached the age of puberty, 
for now she has a menstrual cycle. She can no longer remain in the temple for a number of reasons we don't need to mention them. So she goes back to her parents' home. How old is she? That is irrelevant. What we are concerned with is biological age. She has now reached the age of puberty. That age differs for different times, okay? It is at this time that Allah sends the angel, Ibrahim And when the angel comes to her, she becomes pregnant. So it is shortly after the age of puberty that Allah chose that she should become a mother. Are you going to say to him that he is irresponsible? Who is going to do that? The divine wisdom is at work. And now we come to the more interesting one. They say that the Prophet was married Aisha. He married Aisha. I'm not bothered about the age. That's not important now, whether it was six or seven or eight or nine or ten. So don't talk to me on that. He married Aisha. Where's the evidence? You were the one who said it, eh? Who conducted the marriage? And who were the witnesses? Haju Burhanakum. In a marriage, you have the freedom to choose to marry. And if you want to decline, you have the freedom to decline, otherwise the marriage contract is invalid. Was this present in this marriage ceremony? <laughs> huh? So if you say that there was a marriage ceremony, that's the only way you could possibly say that he married her. If you say that he married her, then there had to be a marriage ceremony. And if there was a marriage ceremony, these are the conditions of a marriage ceremony. And I say he never married her. So I don't have to bring all that up. I say there was never any marriage ceremony. So we don't have to find out who says, what was the name of the marriage officer? And what are the name of the witnesses? I say this marriage was contracted in heaven. Allah chose her as his wife. And when Allah and his messenger has decreed a thing, there is no option. No option. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala has no option. Her parents have no option. Because Allah has decreed it. There is no marriage ceremony of Ijab and Kubul because Allah has already married them. So to say that the Prophet Muhammad married Aisha is false. Never use that term that he married her. Rather you should say that Allah himself married them. If you want to use that terminology. He took the decision, he ordered that they be married. He could have, if he wanted, decided on this before she was born. Yeah. He could have, if he wanted, take the decision when she was one day old. Yes, he could have done it. One day old, she's one day old. So it is irrelevant whether it was before she was born or whether it was when she was only one day old or whether it was, it was when she was six, to six years old. It was irrelevant. Age has no significance here. Because Allah who created her from a drop of sperm, He's the one who took the decision. 
So to say that the Prophet married her at age six is false. <coughs> Having disposed of that, and those who disagree will have to inform me who was the marriage officer and who were the witnesses and whether the contract of Ijab and Kabul was there and whether there was any choice in the matter. Well then when was the marriage consummated? Answer, the marriage was consummated when she reached the age of puberty. Which is exactly what happened in the case of Maryam alayhi salam. Allah ordained that she become pregnant at the age when she had just attained the age of puberty. Now it may come as a surprise to you, but just one or two generations ago, most girls were married shortly after the age of puberty. I know several in my own little island, my own little Caribbean island of Trinidad, excuse me, my own little beautiful Caribbean island of Trinidad, <laughs> who were married at ages of 13 and 14, and it was common. Such marriages were common until Dajjal came along and Dajjal brainwashed our people and all of mankind because he wants to bring about a world of zina a world in which no woman will be married and be still a virgin no you must have lost your virgin long ago she's a schoolgirl and she's uh, attending school in Minnesota and she is 14 years of age she's already had two abortions and that's no big thing. <laughs> it's commonplace. Huh? This is the child's plan. To bring about a sexual revolution that will attend or be a byproduct of the feminist revolution. Well, then how do we respond? In the Muslim village, our daughters would not be forced to be married against their will. No. No one can force a girl to marry against her will. No! Our daughters will be married. We would recommend marriage early because this is the natural thing and this is the sunnah. And when our daughters have their babies, the first baby will be born when the body is still young. That's the best time. No man will ever know what it takes for a woman to give birth to a baby. The terror, the terror that must be in the heart of a woman if she is 35 years of age and giving birth to her first baby. Terror in her heart. Will I survive? Or will I die? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to come out of this as a triple or whatever it is? But thank God now we have experts with us today who can explain the subject better than I can. And so our, our daughters will have their babies when they are young. And secondly, early marriage helps to preserve, preserve the moral fabric of the society. And also, the, the, there are no women in the village who are unmarried and who yet want a husband. If a woman is unmarried in the village, it's because she chooses to remain unmarried, and that's her choice. The village will have lots and lots and lots of children. Notice I didn't use the word kids. I don't know whether you know it, but only goats and Americans have kids. So, Imran always speaks of children and he laughs inside of him when he hears you talking about your kids. <laughs> she, is she really a goat? She doesn't look like a goat. <laughs> she has kids. 
Mashallah, he said, marry and have children, many children, so that my ummah will grow in size, said the Prophet hmm? We have directed attention to only certain parts of the village. Number one, the unity of the village and dealing with the problem of sectarianism. Number two, self-sufficiency of the village. So, food production. So we need water. Uh, I could have talked about energy, but we could do that later. Yeah, I'm going to stop now. And uh, uh, we talked about the, um, the village and the male-female relationship. And we talked about children in the village. This, this, this does not exhaust the subject. But this gives you a pretty good idea of what direction we're moving in with the subject of getting off the ship that is sinking in order to survive and getting off the ship and then proceeding to seek to establish the deen at the micro level. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless all those our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters who are now convinced to get off the ship and who now be searching for villages in the countryside where they can establish Islam. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samil alim wa tawalina ya mulana inna ka inta tawawakim. Barakatika ya Allah. Ameen.